I would like to formally let Andy know the answer to his question about my metamorphosis. <coughs> oh, Andy, would you like to ask me a question again about my metamorphosis? Uh, yes, my, my question was, uh, if you could only write one metaphor for metaphor. the rest of your life, what metaphor would it be? I'm sorry, I thought metamorphosis and that's what had me all... <laughs> Ah, kerfunkel. Uh, just a second here. Yes, and no one at home can see that. So I would like to tell you a couple metaphors that, if I only had one to write, I can't really get it down to one. But life is a mere dream, a fleeting shadow on a cloudy day. Might be one. Yes. Love is a lemon, either bitter of sweet. Might be one. Life has a tendency to come back and bite you in the ass. It's just life. So not really a metaphor. But I think the one that I would probably live with to my dying day is the one that Matt Bansell took from me when he made his glorious epic motion picture, The Gamer's Darkness Rising, and gave it to Cass to say something very similar to this witticism. Fire is day. And when it goes out, it's night. <laughs> Thank you. Now, back to the readings. Uh, I would like to start off Act Two, as it were, with Elk Pants. <laughs> Suspicions. We're going to jump in the middle of this as it is a rather lengthy section. And uh, we'll just hit the ground running. Yeah, I do, so knock it the hell off and slow the hell down. Jeremy was yelling now as the anger churned his gut. We've been all through this, and you know where I stand. All right, all right, Greg nodded grimly. You've got spunk, kid, I'll give you that. Up yours. Greg glanced at him sidelong, a smile splitting his weathered and cynical features. The smile turned into a chuckle, which turned into a laugh. Despite himself, Jeremy found himself joining in. You are one crusty old bastard, Jeremy said finally. <laughs> yep. Uh, one Adam 75 come back. The computerized dispatcher's voice. One Adam 75 come back. <laughs> the computerized dispatcher's voice came over the comm system. This is one Adam 57. Go ahead, Jeremy answered. We have 187. We have a 187 at the corner of 4th and Union, apartment 25. Please respond, the dispatcher reported. On our way. Greg flipped on the siren and the lights and jammed the wheel hard to the right. The building at the corner of 4th and Union was one of the original Art Deco structures from the 1930s. Dwarfed by the newer mega structures around it, it had been well maintained and managed to hold its own as a valid place to live. Jeremy even thought it had charm. Blue flashing lights drew his attention as they approached, peering closer. He saw three squad cars resting on the worn pavement of 4th Ave in front of the building. Two uniformed officers milled about in front of the ornate glass doors, near an older gray-haired man in a traditional doorman long jacket and slacks, and a single elk. Unlike most of the creatures, this elk wore a similar coat to the man's. A half dozen keys on what looked like shoestrings hung down from his antler rack as he stood there staring straight ahead. A name tag on his lapel read, Reginald, valet assistant. <laughs> Here we go. Greg brought them in for the landing behind these vehicles, popped his door and jumped out. Jeremy followed suit, pulling his long wool overcoat tighter against the winter chill of the evening air. He climbed out of the car, allowing its vertically opening door to fall shut, and joined Greg near the two officers. Clad in their stereotypical blue coats and hats with utility-slash-gun belts wrapped around their waists, the officers did their best to stand at some semblance of attention as they spoke to Greg, but it was clear from their ashen faces that they had seen something horrifying. It's terrible, the officer on the left, a broad-shouldered man, said. I've never seen anything like it. Aye, the taller, slimmer officer said on the right. 
<laughs> Jesus, you look like hell. Greg's hand played with the buttons of his overcoat, a nervous habit that allowed him easy access to his pistol if needed. What is it? What did you see? Jeremy paused next to his partner and looked into the officer's haunted eyes, one man at a time. These were seasoned cops who had seen their share of homicide victims. To think that something could have shocked them so much was disconcerting to say the least. We're not allowed to say, and I think you need to see for yourself, the broad-shouldered officer said. His taller partner nodded in agreement. Not allowed, Greg frowned. On whose order? The Cattons. Right. Greg turned towards the door. Then we'd better get in there. What could be so bad that the Captain's got a gag order in place, Jeremy wondered aloud. Let's find out. Greg cast a wary, suspicious eye at the elk ballet parking key attendant, gave the doorman a curt nod, and proceeded inside. With a final look at the officers, Jeremy followed him into the building. As Jeremy slipped under the yellow police line stretched across the door to the apartment, it became immediately evident that something was very wrong. Four other officers milled about, talking amongst themselves nervously in the hallway, as if afraid to go any further into the place. The hardwood floorboards creaked beneath them as they constantly shifted their weight. Jeremy straightened and took in the rest of the passage, noting the framed family pictures, many of them the old black and white photos of an age gone past, others more modern digital picture frames that cycled through a variety of images as he watched. Three closed doors on the left and one on the right appeared immaterial as the activity in the place appeared to be in the living room at the end of the hallway. Greg pushed past him, ignoring the officers. Jeremy followed several feet behind but stopped short as Greg came to a jarring halt. The big man's jaw dropped and as Jeremy drew up beside him at the mouth of the apartment's large and luxurious living room he saw why. Blood and gore smeared the hardwood floors, the expensive Persian throw rug, the walls, and the high vaulted ceilings. But that was not the truly disturbing thing. The corpse of a white-haired gentleman in tattered and torn clothes lay face down at the remains of a glass and wood coffee table where he had fallen. A broken antler stuck out of his back. But it was the hoof print in the man's dented skull that told the true tale of his death. Jesus Christ, Greg said finally. It can't be, Jeremy insisted. Elks are domesticated. It had to be true because if it wasn't, we were all in trouble. Greg turned back to look at him, opened his mouth to speak but stopped. His eyes widened as he stared at the wall on Jeremy's right, his face turning a ghostly shade of white, his pupils dilating. Jeremy whirled around to look at what could possibly cause the man such fear and concern, and then he saw it. Scrawled in blood on the wall were the words, No pants! No more! <laughs> Above those words, a pair of torn red elk pants had stuck to the wall by a gore-smeared meat cleaver. God help us, Jeremy gasped, knowing in that moment that life as he had known it was about to change forever. God help us all. <laughs> My foray into horror 